What's going on everyone? We are back with some more Marvel Snap and today I want to do a shorter video. I know I'm uh, a handful of days late on that and I wanted to apologize for that. I uh, had some issues with my art assets so we had to yeah, put a pause on the videos for a little bit. Uh, but I think the pipeline is back in order. Uh, but we had a patch on June 29th, so about four days ago now. And I want to talk over some of the things that happened in the patch, how it compared to some of my thoughts, and, you know, just give thoughts on the patch as a whole. So let's get on into that. We have patch notes in here. Um, side note, not related to the balance changes, they added a whole lot of visual updates. So, like, Iron Fist has a really cool visual update. Uh, most of the locations have visual updates, you know, video effects, um, sound effects upgraded. Uh, I hope they really continue to do that um, because it looks really awesome. They also added a reminder to claim your free daily credits. It's a little notification on the shop icon. Uh, so that's solid. The daily booster limit, I guess, we'll talk about the whole patch, not just the balance, balance patch. Um... The developer said that the daily booster limit that they put into effect, which is 200 boosters per day, which are independent of the boosters that you get from your um, collection level upgrades or season pass, um, but they said it affects less than 10% of players. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, more hardcore, more whaley, so it feels like that's untrue to me, but maybe it is true. Uh, but I think. On a win, you get six boosters. So doing some quick math off the top of the head, 30 games would be 180 boosters. So you'd have to play about 34 games a day to hit 100 or 200 boosters. Uh, but even that, like at you know two to three minutes per game, that's playing about an hour a day. I don't know. Maybe that is. I feel like I don't know. I feel like. 10% is a low estimate. I understand that a lot of players are probably more casual. They probably play between three to five games per day, um, maybe upwards of you know five to 10. I know not everyone is a hardcore player, uh, but I also think in the CCG world, what equates to essentially, because 34 games is about an hour to an hour and a half of gameplay per day, give or take. Um, I don't think that is outrageous. I don't think only the top 10% of players are on that. Um, I actually, I know everyone is really mad about booster limits in general. I don't, I'm not, I don't like the idea, but I'm not fully against the idea. I just think that the limit needs to be much higher. Uh, I'd honestly probably double it, probably put it to at least 400. Um, if they wanted to try and test in increments, at least go to 300 next. Um, another 100 gives you, like, what is it, 17 additional games per day of getting boosters, give or take. Um, so I think if they're going to do a booster limit, I think it needs to be raised a little bit at least. Um, if not all the way to 400, I think let's go to uh, 250, 300 next and see how that goes. I just, I don't believe that 10% of players um, is it, is only 10% playing that much. Uh, they made some missions easier to complete. I didn't think quests were that hard to complete anyway. But again, maybe that's just because I play a lot. Uh, I do like this change a lot. This was something that I was trying to calculate. I never really got around to making a video on it. But they've increased the experience rewards from the season pass. So that if you only complete the quests in your season pass every season you should come pretty close to completing the entire season pass just based on focusing on the quests, which I think is a how a well-designed battle pass should work. If you're going to hand out quests for battle pass, completing the entire set of quests should basically complete, complete the pass for you. Obviously, you're going to get season experience alongside it, playing games to complete those quests, uh, but I think that's a very welcome change. Um, and it should help players that don't play as much feel good about buying the season pass and still completing it. So I think that was a very nice um, change for the free-to-play slash um, minimally pay. I don't want to say minimally pay, but free-to-play slash only buy the season pass per month crowd. Which is probably a majority of players, to be honest, if we're being honest here. Um, they increased the total amount of credits from the main season pass and decrease the boosters. I like that change as well. 
obviously, like I said, I play a ton. So I was always getting the max amount of boosters possible per day. Now I'm hitting the cap every day. Boosters are not as valuable to me, especially not random boosters of cards that I'm not interested in. I'm the type that I like to upgrade cards that I play a lot, cards that I like, variants that I like. So you handing me 10 random or even like 10 wave boosters, like if next next month the card is a card I don't really care for, I don't care about those boosters. Sure, I'll probably upgrade them a little bit for the collection level, but I don't really care about those boosters. So credits are worth more to me personally. But now let's get into the balance changes. The first one we had was a buff to Colossus. Uh, he just had one text change added. He cannot have his power reduced. He already couldn't be destroyed or moved, and now he cannot have his power reduced. Uh, I think it's a small little buff, but I still think it's pretty solid. Um, things like Scorpion don't see a lot of play right now. Things like Yellow Jacket don't see a lot of play right now. So the combos with Colossus aren't as relevant. Uh, but the locations that give you minus one, minus two, minus three power are very relevant and happen quite a bit. So Colossus being there is pretty solid. Um, also, I think people have started experimenting with sort of like a hazmat control shell. And while I don't think that shell is all the way there, and I don't think Colossus on his own really answers that shell very well, um, Colossus can be an interesting tech card if those kinds of decks ever become more popular. So, um, I don't think this really makes Colossus fit into a lot more decks, but it makes him better and at least something that can be considered in the future, whereas in the past I think he just really wasn't that worth it. Next we have a change to Crystal. I don't have Crystal yet. Crystal's a card that I was actually pretty interested in unlocking, we'll see if I ever get to her. Uh, but before, she shuffled your hand into your deck and drew three cards all the time. Uh, and now they've changed her to, if this is at the middle location, shuffle your hand into your deck and draw three cards. Um, it's interesting, because as they noted, they want to give players the option of whether they actually trigger the effect or not. Uh, however, forcing it into a specific location in order to trigger that effect makes it, honestly, almost more situational. Uh, the dev said they wanted more flexibility with the card, uh, but I almost think this makes her less flexible. In a deck where you're running Crystal, you probably want the effect to trigger fairly often, if not all the time. So needing to put her in a specific location where maybe um, Sanctum Sanctorum is an effect, or you know you don't really want to put a four power card against, maybe your opponent's going really heavily invested on that middle location, and you don't want to put four power there because you're going to kind of let that location go. Um, so I feel like this was an attempt at a buff, but I think this might have actually made this card worse. I can't really give you a full, like, wholehearted opinion on this because I don't have the card to really test that out, and I didn't have it before the change to really see where it felt like she was falling short. So maybe they have the data and I'm just kind of talking gut feeling here, but I feel like this buff actually might have made Crystal worse, but we'll see. Next we have Destroyer. He went from a 614 to a 616, still with Unrevealed Destroyer other cards. Um, I think they need to do stuff like this to a lot of the six drops in the game. Um, most of the six drops are relatively weaker for the stipulations they have and just for the game in general. Uh, like you have things like Chavez, who's 10 power, who's probably the most played six drop, compared to Hulk, who's vanilla, has 11 power. But Chavez, you can guarantee you draw her on turn six and not before, whereas Hulk, you might not ever draw him or you might draw him early and he clear clogs your hand. You got things like Giganto. Giganto is a pretty solid card, but that's 14 power to be stuck in the left lane. Um, whereas even, I guess we'll talk about the dinosaur change next. Devil Dinosaur can hit 14 power and all you have to do is have a full hand. Um, Giganto might not have been the best example there, but I think there's quite a few six drops that need to get a little bit stronger. Probably the same with five drops. And honestly, a lot of the later curve cards need some tweaking. Um, but yeah, Destroyer, mm, with that downside, having 16 power is worth it. And I know you're probably only playing Destroyer if you have things like Cosmo to where he doesn't trigger his effect, or things like Zero. Uh, but just the risk and the other, the actual downside on paper makes Destroyer probably deserving of that two power buff. And I have seen him quite a bit more since that change. 
Next, we have one of the stars of the show. We have Devil Dinosaur kind of doing exactly what I said it was going to do. Uh, it went from a three cause zero power to a four cause zero power. Um, I also do think they could have probably kept it at three cost and done plus one power. Um, but now this can be a four cost conditional 14 power, um, which is still the strongest four drop in raw power pretty much in the game. Um, and it's still really easy to invest in. The only thing that's bringing this down is that they also changed Moon Girl. If they left Moon Girl alone and just changed Double Dinosaur to four, I think Double Dinosaur would still be basically just as good as he used to be, besides not being able to play two on turn six, which is exactly what I said they should have done, because playing two on turn six is still uh, kind of too much. Um, so now they've done a... I think they did a really good job with this nerf. Um, four power is fair. It still has a very high power ceiling for a four drop, uh, but now it's just... You can't passively have this card be the strongest card in your deck while also doing other things. Uh, because De Dinosaur at 3 meant I toss this thing down, I'm playing Collector, I'm playing Nova, I'm playing Moon Girl. All these things are cheap, I'm going to have a full hand anyway, my hand's constantly going to be full, it's going to be 14 power for basically no effort. Now it costs 4, we'll talk about Moon Girl in a minute, but Moon Girl costs 4. Both of those things are slow plays now, where if you want a 14 power Dinosaur, and 14 power, like I said, is still top tier for a 4 drop, if you want that 14 power, you're going to have to really invest into that specifically. Otherwise, it'll be a 4 power, uh, you know, 8 to 10 power, or 4 energy 8 to 10 power card, which is a lot more on curve. Uh, even 4 power, 4 energy 8 power is crossbones level, or things like warpath level, and those are um, hard condition 4 drops and the top end of the power curve for 4. So dinosaur is still very good, don't get me wrong. Next we have Doctor Strange. This is one I actually loved. And I don't think I put it in the video where I was talking about buffs, uh, but it was one that I had considered. I actually almost wanted him to be a two drop, but I think this is fair as well. Uh, Doctor Strange was a three energy two power. They have bumped him up to a three energy three power. Um, I like this just because Doctor Strange being three, it really wasn't that powerful of a play. Um, so you needed a little bit of power to go along with it. Even if you pulled like your Vulture and got plus five power, um, it's still kind of a slow turn. Um, so the one extra power makes it just a little bit easier to swallow. And this in conjunction with the next change we're going to talk about, uh, really gave move decks a little bit more consistency. Because move decks were in a little bit of a weird spot before. Um, I haven't really seen Dagger too often to speak to kind of the max capability, but let's say your average move deck with multiple man, human torch, Vulture, you know, pick a couple of those. Um, it really was kind of easy to predict just because Heimdall being your big payoff and Iron Fist also being your mini payoff moves everything to the left. If you detected your opponent was playing a move deck, you kind of just started investing on the right lane, which became almost a guaranteed win. And then you would just have to pick and choose between the left and middle lane, depending on where you could predict their Vulture ending up. Um, and what I mean by that is Doctor Strange was kind of weak, um, so they had to play it on three, or they had to play it at a certain time frame. So Doctor Strange was one of the main, basically the only way, besides Cloak, to move your move cards back to the right. So if Doctor Strange had either already been played or wasn't being included, you knew that if Vulture was in the middle lane, that come end game when they played Heimdall, Vulture's going to end up in the left lane, so all you had to do is invest in the right lane and the middle lane, and you didn't have to worry about moon, move decks at all. You just invested in those lanes where they couldn't focus. Uh, so now Doctor Strange being stronger means it's a easier play to swallow, moving your cards back to the right side, and then in conjunction with Kraven, you have a little bit more power to spread around so you can actually fight for all three lanes instead of just two. Speaking of Kraven... He is now, when a card moves here, this gets plus two power. It used to be plus one power. And this power is very relevant. Uh, Kraven actually, I think, is a, quite a good move card now. Um, especially with things like Heimdall. Um, if, let's say, Kraven was your first card played. When you play Heimdall, I know all four cards move together. But in the game, it moves them one at a time in order of being played. So Craven actually moves first, and then the other three cards move with him afterwards. 
in order, which means Craven, when you play with Heimdall and Craven's in a full lane, it gets plus six power as well. Um, you can combo this with things like Cloak early, and Craven just gave move decks kind of another um, way to go tall outside of the specific move cards. Um, so now you have cards that move, and then Craven is a destination instead of the actual mover. So you can actually keep, you know, your Vulture, your Human Torch away from Craven if you have to, and then you can move your Doctor Stranges and your Iron Fists and your other ancillary support cards into Craven and still give Craven a buff, and then you have your power spread all over the board. Uh, so not only was Craven kind of like the roleplay move card that didn't see any play because it wasn't good enough, now he fits into the deck and he's actually quite a good part of that deck. Next up, we've got Moon Girl. I already talked about her a little bit. Uh, Moon Girl has gone up to four cost and four power, and I think this was perfectly fair as well. Um, Moon Girl was, I know power level wise, in terms of the amount of power you put on the board, Moon Girl was the weakest of the Dino Nova Collector Moon Girl deck, but Moon Girl behind the scenes was really the engine that made that car run. She allowed double Nova, double Dinosaur, double Collector. Um, when she duplicated your hand, it counts as new cards for a Collector. It counts as new cards for a Dino. Um, so Moon Girl really was the engine that kept that thing running. And I touched on this a little bit in my previous video where I talked about things that should be nerfed. Moon Girl being so cheap and so flexible meant that the design space in the future for powerful, low-cost cards would forever be limited because of Moon Girl. So I like that they pointed that out. They recognize it. Obviously, they are professionals, and I'm just a, a guy on YouTube. Um, but I like that they pointed that out and preemptively made this move to limit future problems. Because they easily could have made her, you know, even zero power, three, three cost zero power, and she'd be a problem in the future, if not a continued problem. So I'm glad to see that they did that change. And now Moon Girl very much is a specific piece for a specific type of deck rather than just yamming her into everything. Next up we've got Nova. Nova, this was the other predictor change. Um, this is the one that I told you all to, to look out for because it was the simplest change. Nova has gone from when this card is destroyed give your cards plus two power down to plus one power. Um, it's crazy because you don't see Nova anywhere right now. But I still think Nova is playable, but I guess it's just not playable in everything, and that's why we haven't seen it. Um, I also think as more people unlock things like Killmonger, I think Nova might see a slight uptick in play again, uh, just because Carnage and Deathlock aren't things you're super excited about playing unless it's for Nova, the old Nova, so I guess that's why. Um, but yeah, uh, Nova decks have virtually disappeared from the ladder. I'm not upset about that <laughs> one bit. Um, but we'll see how things progress. Nova was far and away the single most powerful card you can slam down on turn six. If you had multiple, it was just game ending. Uh, so I'm glad to see Nova brought down in power level. And it's still on paper one of the more powerful one drops. Uh, it's just not something that you can slam into every single deck, which I'm okay with. Now this one was a surprise buff for me. Okoye went from a two cost one power to a one cost one power but they changed the effect from give every card in your deck plus two power down to give every card in your deck plus one power. Now, I understand that Okoye previously was basically play her on turn two or you never played her because she wouldn't be good enough. I recognize that that was a thing. However, Okoye being a one drop now kind of makes her the new in the running for best one drop in the game if not best one drop in the game just one drop that fits into almost every single deck in the game it's okoye is just super super strong now even like let's say you play her on turn one you've already drawn a card you've got five of additional turns of card draw so without any additional draw okoye is giving you five additional power which gives her a one energy for six power output basically guaranteed and that's not counting things like camartage um, drawing additional cards. Um, 
So while she may not hit the power ceilings that things like Human Torch or Old Nova could do, or even Current Nova could do, just Okoye is a super, super consistent, zero investment needed, high upside card. Um, and it's just awesome. Uh, I didn't think this card needed to be buffed, especially when you compare it to things like Forge now. Forge is a two energy, one power, give one card plus two power, which is now two energy for three power, unless you play it on things like uh, Mr. Sinister or uh, Brood. But I think Okoye did not need a buff, and you're going to kind of see her everywhere. I don't think she is necessarily overpowered. I just think too powerful for the consistency she provides, and she's going to kind of become ubiquitous until we get some more powerful one drops. And maybe that's the plan for second dinner is to include some more powerful one drops, and then Okoye will be a decision instead of a given. And finally, we have White Queen. This is a change I was very much on board with as well. Uh, she was a 4-6. She still is a 4-6. She went from, if your opponent has a 6 cost, draw the 6 cost from their hand. Um, and now it's draw a copy of the highest card in hand. So now she's just a guaranteed plus 1. And 4 energy for 6 power is, uh, I would say, about average to maybe slightly above average the guaranteed power level of a 4 cost. What I mean by that is things like Warpath are a 4-5 that can be a 4-9, but let's say 5 is the floor. Uh, so 6 cost or six power for 4 energy I think is maybe slightly above, if not just the high end of average on the power curve. And then you get a guaranteed plus 1 card, and you're getting knowledge on what's in your opponent's hand. Uh, I still think White Queen is a little bit awkward to fit into a lot of decks. But I think her effect is actually quite powerful now. That's a decent amount of power to put down. You're generating a card, so you're getting some card advantage out of her. And you're also getting the knowledge of what's in your opponent's hand. Uh, so I think White Queen is quite solid. They also had some location updates, mostly text updates. Um, but then they added a couple changes. Uh, Nowhere does not delete cards anymore. Now it makes on reveal effects not trigger because they added a new location called death's domain which now has nowhere's effect um they have starlight citadel which swaps the positions of each location that one's kind of interesting to play around icebox gives one card in each player's hand plus one cost that's iceman's effect and a tillin which on turn four shuffles your hand to your deck and draws three cards um they're just interesting i don't think any of these are super disruptive including the new nowhere effect i just like seeing more and more locations added because now that is more and more things you have to try and play around each game and they also increase the appearance rate for negative zone space thrown in nowhere um i think that's fair as well i think they probably should have included if they're gonna include space throne i think they should have included sanctum santorum in there but is what it is uh, overall, I think this was a really solid um, patch. I think this showed that the developers have a pretty good handle on balance. Um, I'm very happy with the changes they made. Uh, the only downside of this patch for me was the uh, booster limit. Uh, but they said they're collecting data on this. Uh, so I'm going to give this a grade of incomplete for the booster limit because at the moment, don't like it, understand it. I understand their, their thought process. I just think the amount needs to be tweaked. Uh, so I'm gonna give them maybe a patch or two to change this amount before I make a final say on that. But the battle pass changes in terms of credits and um, quest experience, the balance changes, the locations and the visuals added, um, I think make up for the kind of shadow of the booster limit for now. Overall, I think it was a fantastic patch. Uh, but let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section. Uh, we'll have some more uh, deck gameplays coming up soon. A couple of them will be pre-patched just because I had some old videos um, that I was waiting for thumbnails on. But we'll get those out, play some new decks soon, and we'll uh, keep it rolling on the ladder. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys all very much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. Peace.